Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name is Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker, licensed real estate broker right here in Santa Clara County, California, serving the Bay Area since 1988. And man, was that a long time ago. Um, here to give you a, another show. I know it's been a couple of weeks. I apologize. I do not know what's going on. Uh, I've actually encountered several other people who are experiencing the same thing, but I've been fighting off some sort of something for a month, maybe a month and a half. It seems like it'll go away for a few days and then it'll kick back in. Um, I have taken all of the cough things and all of the flu things. I don't have COVID. At least I know that much. I, I took a test for that and I didn't, I didn't have it. Uh, but I was feeling decent enough to actually maybe do a show today. So I thought I'd throw one out there for you. And I do again, apologize for the the lack of shows over the last two weeks, I think it's been since the last one. Um, interesting things to discuss. And we're, we're going to discuss those in the upcoming coffee and real estate live chat. Now that is going to be the 16th. So that's just five, six, five, four days away. Uh, so this Saturday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. If you'd like to join in, we are going to discuss all of the latest numbers covering November for real estate, um, and it's it's turning out to be a pretty robust market. We're going to talk about interest rates. We'll talk about local real estate news, and then kind of compare that to the national headlines and see where we're where we're sort of sitting as the market goes. So make sure to join me there. You can find it on Facebook. You can go to my web page at soldbyrobert.com. Scroll down a little bit, and there'll be a link to the uh, central location there on Facebook, but you'll also be able to find it on my YouTube channel, uh, on LinkedIn and on uh, Twitter. Facebook is usually the best place to go because then that's the, the easiest place for me to see the folks who are chatting with me. So keep that in mind as we go. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about? You know, this is a subject that's come up lots and lots. In fact, when I first started doing this show way back in 2007, uh, in fact, this January, man, how many years will it be? Uh, seven, 14, uh, wow, so that'll be 17 years? Is that how many years it'll be coming in January? Uh, anyway, you know, what, what is, what's wrong with real estate agents today? What, what are the biggest problems? And, and to be honest, these aren't new problems. There are problems that are specific to the, what we're seeing today, like most agents today have never seen a down market, right? Anyone who's gotten into this market, well, I guess if they've got around right after the 2006, 7, 8 downturn, they started their market when things were low, but a whole lot of them never saw that. They didn't get into the market until a few years after that when things started to pick up a little bit. So many of them simply don't have the skills they need. And unfortunately, and that's kind of what we're going to lean into today, they don't have this. There's no easy way to get those skills without doing it. And negotiating and understanding sort of the psychology behind how getting to get offers accepted and, and marketing a home effectively. All of these things were previously kind of overwhelmed by market momentum, right? When you have a market where no matter what you do, if you just put a home on the MLS, it's going to sell. Really, those really good agents are only going to make a difference in the margins, right? They, and, and those margins can be pretty big, right? You're, if you're, your house is going to sell, but there's a big difference between selling it for 1% above for asking price or 2% above asking price and 8% above, above asking price. And my argument would be that a really good agent is going to be able to get enough eyeballs on your property to, to get you that 108% uh, on the asking price of your property. But you'll feel okay with that 101 because you don't know any better. You don't know what the average list price to sales price ratio is, right? You don't know what the average above or under is for homes. It's just not data that's typically shared because the real estate market as an industry has got you sold on the ideas that you should be looking for the top 1% agent. And, and again, I have done shows exclusively on this, how whether a agent is or is not a top 1% agent should not come into your concern at all. It means absolutely nothing because there's a variety of different things that could be based on. It could be based on how many homes an agent sold over some specific period of time. It could be based on the total dollar value of homes that were sold over a specific period of time. Uh, it, it could be a variety of different things. And here's the fun part. An agent can achieve that goal at any time in their career. Now, I've been at it for more than 30 years, and I know agents who were maybe got the most listings in the third quarter of 1996 
and never again and have never done anything that put them in the top 1% again, but that top 1% achievement is going to be on their business card until the day they die. And it means absolutely nothing. Or it means it means something to the agent and to the agent's broker, but it should mean nothing to you as a buyer or a seller or an investor. It, it simply is meaningless because it's based on numbers. Unless you're an investor and you have 100 homes to sell, maybe the number of homes that an agent sold in a year matters to you. But I'm going to argue that even that agent who did sell 100 homes in a year uh, is going to do not as good a job for you as a typical agent who simply does the job better but has never been a top 1% agent, right? And there's an awful lot of those. Uh, I like to think of myself as one. I definitely focus on quality rather than quantity, but let's get right down to it. What are, what are some of the problems? And my, my core assumption here is, and this is one of those shows that appeals to everybody. I don't typically do shows aimed directly at real estate agents. Uh, I toyed with a doing a podcast just for real estate agents a while back called Being the Better Agent. Um, and I got to admit, I, I, it, there is such a hill to climb when it comes to getting agents to really focus on what matters most to clients, because it is a metric that judges directly how well they're doing their job, and most of them aren't doing it very well. I, when I first started recruiting agents for my brokerage firm, uh, I had a group of folks in and I pitched them this idea that we'd have a scorecard and all of our scores would be based on all these things that matter most to clients, right? getting them the most money, getting the most money the fastest, et cetera, et cetera. The things that buyers and sellers care about. No takers. Nobody wanted to take on, and I was giving them excellent splits. I was giving them the best splits in the valley uh, in terms of how much their commission they'd be able to keep. But none of them wanted to take on a gig where they would actually be accurately judged on the quality of the service that they provided. So just kind of go with that. But, but again, I'm going to claim here that they are not born. Bad real estate agents are not born. There are some that are born who shouldn't be agents, but are, they're made. The system tends to churn them out. Uh, and I know that for an awful long time, the system that creates real estate agents tried to beat a lot of things out of me. And maybe I shouldn't have resisted so much. Maybe there's some logic there because what I'm selling here, what I'm pitching isn't the get rich quick version of real estate. What I'm pitching is the, how you do the best job for your clients version of doing real estate which doesn't equal closing 300 escrows a year. It simply doesn't. Um, so that, and that's what we wanna focus on here. I've been through training. I've been through both the state training to get my license, both licenses, my real estate license, salesperson's license, and my broker's license. And I've been through the agent introduction training in several prominent, well-known local real estate firms. Um, some that are very sought after and very respected. None of them offered any effective training on, well, that's not fair. The, the absolute dominant training, the most prevalent training, the 99% training was how to get leads, how to get, and that's, and that's not a part of the business you should ignore, but it is, it is one that you shouldn't, you shouldn't focus on that to the expense of the actual skills of performing well for your clients. But there is so much fog around how well an agent does, right? The, how well an agent does is judged by their advertising, by the quality of their headshot on the, on the Google page that they have, on their personal web page. And I tell you, it is a joke to me when I go and I look, because I'm, I'm, I am a, uh, a person who, who will emulate stuff that works. In other words, I'll go out and I will look for real estate agents that are, are talking about how well, well they're doing or, or who I have done some research on through the MLS using tools only agents have <laughs> to see if they're actually doing a really good amount of business. And I'll try to emulate whatever lead generation stuff they're doing. So, you know, and in the process of doing that, I also will lean into how well they do their job. But let, let's go ahead and hit my bullet points here. I went to a lot of trouble making some notes. So let me actually use my freaking notes. Uh, as quantity increases, quality decreases. That's anybody who understands scaling and, and manufacturing understands that the custom angle of a thing or how unique it is on an individual basis goes away when quantity is what's happening, when you're cranking that thing out, right? Uh, it doesn't necessarily, like on a, a car, it maybe isn't a great example, because 
I, I guess at some point the quantity will cause an expense to quality. I mean, if you're if you're doing it beyond capacity, but we're not talking about that, are we? We're talking about an interpersonal experience where human beings come together to decide how much to buy or sell a piece of property for. So the service, luckily for agents, can be very nebulous, right? It can be this wonderful non pin downable thing. But the reality is, is there are some pin downable numbers. So we're going to talk about those today so that you as buyers, sellers and investors can understand what you should be paying attention to and, and trying to get a context of what is a good agent because it isn't what you've been told. It never has been. I, I have never lived in a time when the metrics used to judge whether or not an agent is good at their job or not has been accurate. It's always been how many houses did they close last year? How much money did they make for the brokerage, et cetera? Now, agents that do lots of deals tend to perform below average in the metrics that actually matter to clients. Example, uh, a recent agent, and I'm going to give you more specific numbers on this one because this is a very interesting one that happened to me within the last month. Uh, I'll give you the circumstances of that in a minute, but I sat down and compared one, two, three, four, five, six different agents and ran the numbers on them just to see how well they perform. And every one of these agents, and I was involved, I was one of the agents in it, I was the only agent who didn't claim to be a top 1% agent. Now I could, uh, using the criteria that I'm the top performing agent in my brokerage would be accurate, but I'm also the only agent right now at my brokerage. I don't have any agents working under me, but that's not unusual. I, I know agents, I know brokers who put themselves as a top 1% agent because they're the top performer in their brokerage when they're the only agent in their brokerage. So, but I won't do that because I don't, it makes me feel gross uh, and dirty. So I don't do that. Okay, so uh, a recent agent who noted as a top 1% agent had a 20% failure rate. This is, I'm just throwing this out there as an example. We're gonna get into the numbers on this in a second. Meaning that two out of 10 of his homes do not sell and they get, can they get canceled or they expire. What's interesting about that is this was over a time period when homes are selling just because they exist. And remember, I live in the market where a house that was half burned down sold in less than two weeks about a year and a half, two years ago. So to have a house not sell in the market that has been the reality we've lived in for the last two or three years and have it be canceled, and, and most of these were cancels, tells you that the people who had listed the house were very unhappy with what was happening and they canceled the listing. And in a few cases on this one, it was an expired listing, meaning it went through the full range of time that was set forth. And, and I looked at this one and this was, there was no reason why any of these should have happened. It was strictly just not follow through from the agent involved. But anyway, if an agent tells you how many deals they do in a year, do the math to figure out how many hours that means they worked on each deal on average so, they, so that you can know how many hours on average do you expect to get out of your agent. There are agents out there that will brag that they're closing over 300 deals a year. Uh, if, if, uh, if we do the math on that and we have 52 weeks in the year and assume they take no vacations and then we see that there's 40 hours in a week, uh, that's 2,080 hours and if they do 300 homes, that means they gave 6.9 hours to each listing. Do you believe that for, assuming you went for a full 6% commission, which means they're gonna keep half of it or 3%, do you believe that person deserves 3% of your home's price for seven hours of work? Less than a full hour, less than a full day of work for the time. Uh, my argument would be no. Uh, I know I invest a great deal more than that amount of time. Um, I, I, and, and, and that doesn't, that's not a, that's actually not a praise thing for me because there, there are probably plenty of things I do that I'm a little anal, anal retentive about that I should delegate to someone else that I don't. Um, but I keep, the bottom line is the result is you don't need to talk to anyone else to know what's going on with your listing. I know because I'm doing it. You're, I'm the guy you hired. So, and I, do I have a team of people who I use to back me up? Yes but they're invisible to all of my clients. You don't ever have to know their number. You don't have to know anything about them because I know what's going on at every minute. And I think you deserve an agent who's giving you that kind of attention on your, on your transaction. Uh, let's see, most of the training that's received is how to find leads, not how to effectively address the needs of buyer and seller clients. Focusing on quantity makes agents who engage in it far easier to automate out of existence. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. So, so all of you out there, the lessons for each group of, of people that I'm talking to, for for uh, home sellers, people who want to sell their home, understand the metrics that you should be judging your agents by. And we're going to go over the magic. The next big bullet point is, so how should real estate agents be judged? And we're going to talk about that. 
for you buyers, we're going to talk a little bit about what you should expect there. Obviously, what you should expect is that on average, your agent gets you a better deal on the price than the average in the marketplace. So if you are able to buy a home for 2% below asking price, and in that market for a comparable home at that time over the last three months, the average home is selling for 2% over asking price, well then the odds are that you got a good deal for yourself. Uh, because of the low volume, it's probably hard to find comparables that actually can answer that question for you. But those are the kind of metrics you wanna keep in your head right now. And feel free to widen the circle if necessary um, to, to try to get more data on that. Just keep in mind that as you widen that circle, it may not be as applicable to the specific house that you're talking about. But that doesn't mean you ignore it. That means you take it, you understand its limitations, and you judge based on those realities. To motivate new agents, and this, this, is, this is really at the crux of bad agents aren't born, they're made, is that to motivate new agents, offices and trainers, and this is what happened to me, uh, will suggest they tape a picture of that BMW or Porsche they want to buy on their monitor. That's supposed to be their motivation, right? It's, it's supposed to be that the yacht or the speedboat or the, the whatever. It's, and it's almost, I've never seen someone who didn't have like a luxury item uh, as, their, as their picture on the monitor. Um, for me, it's always been, and it still is, I have it right there. It's been a picture of my boys and, you know, family and that kind of stuff. And, and I don't, I'm not trying to turn this into a yay or yay Robert thing. These are things you should actually be aware of. You know, I don't, I don't think that this is a smart way to get agents motivated in a direction that, that, that teaches them how to be better at the actual job. Do they need to understand how to get leads and be effective at doing it? Absolutely. You, you can't do real estate without clients. But there are things, mindsets that are introduced through the system. Like whenever you're out trying to get leads, what do they call that? Farming. So you're supposed to be mentally connecting buyers and sellers that you're out there trying to get in contact with that, with cattle right? And that's just another mental thing that annoys me. It's, it's all these different little subtle ways that you create buyers and sellers as thems that need to be dealt with. And, and there's tons of weird stuff and there's tons of weird stories about dealing with buyers and sellers because buyers and sellers are human. But there are just as many weird stories I can tell about weird real estate agents I've dealt with. In fact, I've dealt with far more weird real estate agents than I have weird buyers, sellers, and investors. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. But now let's focus on, and this is for everybody again, if you're a real estate agent, you should be hearing this and thinking to yourself, yeah, you know, when I got trained, it really was focusing on lead generation. It wasn't focusing on the most important things that you need to keep in mind when you are helping uh, this kind of buyer find a home. Do you need to focus on single, what are the questions you need to ask in order to really know how to satisfy the needs of that client? When you first meet them, is it clear they have some sort of a walking problem. Should you ask them if they want a single story home or a home that has no stairs anywhere to get to the front door or or at least not lots of stairs that could be easily overcome with a ramp, right? Because there are some homes that have 50 steps that lead up to the front door and maybe that's not so great for someone with movement or uh, movement restriction problems that they're facing. But it's just, there's so much of it that doesn't focus on those things, being the best agent, thinking things through, being able to take that professional look at the process and bringing up the things that a typical buyer may not even have thought of that can help them make a better decision about the home that they're trying to buy. And the same goes for a seller. Um, are you going to be honest with them about that mural of Middle Earth in the living room where they've also built a fake oak tree that comes out of the middle of the hardwood floor? Are those things you're going to suggest they remediate or are you just going to say, yeah, you know what, no problem? Because one thing that they should be paying for from you as their agent is, is your honesty. Uh, how you, well you can communicate that honesty in a way that doesn't offend people is obviously going to be a part of the equation. But you've got to be honest. That's one of the things you're being paid to do. So anyway. All right. So moving on. And I think this next part is going to be important again for everybody involved, particularly agents. Because this is a tough one. This is, this is one where when I have conversations with agents, there's a lot of resistance to this. But how, So how should real estate agents be judged? There's, there's several criteria. Now, one of them is uh, how many days on the market on average does it take you to get a home sold? And it's not as simple as a flat number. And unfortunately, that's kind of the way it gets put out there because each house, when I do my numbers, for instance, I track these numbers for me personally when I do a listing appointment to communicate how effective I am at what I do. 
I don't just take the blanket number. When I do a listing presentation for a listing client, for instance, I calculate what the average days on market is for a home of their type. So I note that down in my spreadsheet. And then later when the escrow closes, I put down what was my number. And if I don't beat that number, in some cases, I pay, I pay a price for failing on meeting that metric. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is if we in the listing presentation say, this is how many days it'll take to get your home sold. If I don't sell it in those days, or, or here's the average in the marketplace, right? Because typically that's what the number is. When the agent comes in, they say on average homes with your square footage, your amenities, beds and baths, location, et cetera, is gonna sell in 22 days on average in your marketplace based on comparable properties. Well, then you've got a number, the number to beat. And if on average you beat that number, that's a good thing. That means you're getting home, home sold faster than the average. The next would be sales price ratio versus market ratio. So ratio is how much above or below asking price did a home sell for? But this number needs to not again stand on its own. You need to have done this for comparable property. So this is something I go through whenever I close an escrow. Um, I have the ratio that was in play when I listed the home and I use that as my guide to figure out, did I under or overperform the market? So if I started in a market where the average home was selling for 103% of asking price, my goal is to sell it for 103.1 or higher, right? I want to beat the average. I don't want to be an average or below average performer when it comes to what the sales price is that I get. And of course, markets can make a pivot depending on the time of year, right? If you're right at that time when the market tends to slow, things can, can throw a wrench into that. But again, it's, it's a number that should have some value to you as a seller because that's what you care about. You care about how fast you're gonna get me my money, days on market, and how much money you're gonna get me. Ratio, right? The, but the other thing to keep in mind is how many list price reductions does this agent have? So have they had to reduce their price to get it to the point where an offer would even be made? And these are the kind of numbers that tell you whether or not an agent is good at picking a price. If an agent comes in and will simply throw whatever price on the house that the seller wants, they'll do that because it lets them have a house with their sign in front of it to serve as a marketing tool to get other listings in that neighborhood, right? So that's a bad thing. If you as an agent are in a listing appointment and all the data says that this home is worth $800,000 and that, that seller wants to list it for a million, it may be very difficult to you. You may be very hungry to get that listing, but you need to be honest with them and the data that you've brought with you should show that your number is the accurate number. And you need to remind them that while they, they may get a million dollars, but it will take, assuming the market continues to grow, that it will take them a much longer amount of time to get that million dollars. And if the market goes down, they're suddenly gonna find themselves chasing the market by continually reducing their price to the point where they're gonna get less than they would have gotten if they'd listed with you in the first place. So, and also keep keep in mind that they're, they're, they're paying for ownership costs, right? They're paying their mortgage, they're paying taxes, they're paying interest, they're paying all, or uh, they're paying insurance. All these things are all wrapped in with that. So don't undermine your honest approach by we, being willing to take any price that's dictated by a seller if, if it's not connected to reality, right? And, you know, just as a, as a sideline to that, uh, I had a listing appointment recently where that was the conversation. There was someone who just because of their personal experience really believed that their home was worth X amount of dollars. And, you know, they were saying, well, you know, this house down the street sold for two point something million dollars. And I looked it up and it, it didn't sell for two point something million. It sold for one point eight five. Um, and they're well, that per they, they told me they got. Well, yes, that be maybe what they told you. But the county. And the IRS and everybody else believes they sold it for this amount of money. Uh, so that's in terms of comparing and giving you an honest assessment of what your property is going to potentially sell for. This is the data that I have to use. What people tell me and what the records show, if I have to choose which I'm going to believe in, what someone says or what's something written down, I'm going to go with what's written down, uh, what's in the records. So did I get that listing? Don't know yet. Uh, do I want it? You know, I, I, I kind of don't. Um, there's, there's a certain a time when you just need to realize someone in that position isn't hiring you for what they're supposed to be hiring you for. They're supposed to be hiring for your expertise. And at, at some point they disconnect from that and believe they can do it themselves. And they brought up at some point, well, can we just sell it ourselves? I'm all sure you can absolutely sell it by owner, but that, that tends to get you less. You tend to get less money when you're selling by owner than when you're not. Uh, okay. Next. Uh, percentage of listings that result in a sold home. 
So this one's an interesting one, and we talked about it briefly before, but if, if, a, if an agent lists a home, how often does it close escrow? How often does it end up resulting in the seller getting a check? That's fundamentally what the job is, right? To get the home sold. And of course, you want the days on market and the sales price to be in the right place as well, but you want the sale to happen at all. What's very interesting is even in today's market, there, and as I use an example, we have one top 1% agent where 20% of their homes fail to sell by either by being expired or canceled. Now, in, I, I, the agent that I'm specifically referring to, I even corrected this. So the number was actually much higher than 20%. Um, but what I did was I said, any of these properties that were expired or canceled, but were subsequently sold by that agent, I didn't count that as a, as a failure per se. Um, but you got to think there's something not right going on when someone cancels, when I, when I, when a seller cancels a listing on a house three times before ultimately it sells. And each one of those canceled or expired listings went on for months and months and months. It's not like... It's not like it was a weird biz, uh, weird uh, data entry snafu where over the course of four days it got canceled and re-entered several times. But I'm gonna break down these numbers for you in a minute as well. Finally, uh, list price reductions prior to the home actually selling. And by, and by how much? What's the average percentage that you had to drop the price of a house when you listed it? Because that speaks directly to their ability to identify what the right price is. And if, if they have a big number there, that's a concern. Right now, let's go for some examples here. I had a very unique experience with a homeowner within the last month. They currently had the home listed for sale, and they were looking for a new agent. They they had they'd had a home that'd been on the market I think since February or March. Um, it was in a neighborhood I'm very familiar with that is very much in demand, and I could not for the life of me figure out how this home had been on the market this long without selling. So, um, you know, in looking at some of the early, and this is an agent who does, who, who I didn't really fault anything they did do in terms of their marketing. Um, although I thought there were a couple of things missing. And I also noted that there was no marketing done, at least apparently to me, I didn't see any, I didn't see any marketing that was being done on any of the social media outlets. It was strictly just, it, they put it into the MLS and forgot about it. Um, one thing that I like to see when agents are entering listings is when they enter it in the MLS and it goes public that you should go to Zillow and these other sites and update the text because you have a limited number of characters in the description you can use in the MLS, but not so much in Zillow and Trulia and those places. So you can make a much more uh, compelling copy of the description in these other outlets. And, and he hadn't done that. But to be honest with you, a very small percentage of agents I see do that. Uh, maybe... I've maybe seen one other agent in the last five years that does that. So let's go ahead and get into this. So, and I'm not going to give you the names of these agents. I, what I am going to tell you is that every, all of them but one, me, uh, claim to be a top 1% agent, a top, top performing agent. <clears throat> um, some of them, I couldn't figure out how that happened because obviously I can pull up their sales performance going back like a decade. And some of them, there's no way, given, given the number of escrows they've closed, that they were in the top percentage at any time in terms of number of homes or, or dollar values or any of that kind of stuff. So I don't know. I don't know where they got it from, but uh, they were all claiming to be top producers. Now, listing price reductions. This was an interesting range. So this, these were property, this, these were homes where the price was reduced by a certain percentage over the course of the listing before it sold. The highest number was 1.5 or 1.8 percent, so almost a two percent price drop, which is given prices here close to you know like on average a million plus. Uh, the lowest number was 0.3, that was my number, um, but the, the numbers were 0.3, one negative 1.8, negative 0.8. So there was one real close to me. So so she did, she was doing good in terms of getting real close to what that price should be. Uh, negative uh, 1.2 for one, 1 1.5 for another, 1 1.3 for the last one. Now there's sales price ratio. And this is, and remember, this is a time frame that I did this one. This time frame covers a pretty good period of time that includes both periods where the market was above and the market was a little bit above asking price. So this is the sales price ratio for what the price was at the time the home sold. 
Uh, for me, it was uh, 99.4%. The next closest was 98.7, and then the next one was 95.6, then 94.2, which was the lowest. So on average, this person sold a home for 5.8% below asking price. Um, next was 97.5 and 96.9. Average days on market. So given the time frame selected, um, I had the highest. I had I had uh, uh, 34 days versus, uh, or no, I didn't have the highest. Okay, there were two people that were higher than me. I had 34 days versus 21 days for, for one, uh, 42 days for another, 31 days for another, 21 days for another, and 41 days for another. Um, but again, day, average day, days on market should be a, a number that's calculated based on each property. If I were to do, because that's, that's the way to judge it, right? You can't just take that number and say, wow, that's, that's too many. There was a period of time where an awful lot of my business was happening in areas where the days on market was much longer. And some of this data overlapped with times when the market was slower and it was taking longer to get homes sold. So if you looked on each individual home, I was beating the market in terms of days on market. But when you averaged it all out, it came up to this 34 days, which was uh, high, highest, not high, the third highest in this ranked list. So right in the middle of the pack in terms of that number. And then percent of listings that expire or canceled, uh, I had less than one half of a percent. Uh, then the next one was 11%. The next one was 7%, then 2.6%, then 4.4%, then 20% uh, of the, this person's listings uh, failed. And again, for that 20% one, because it was so crazy, I went through and for all the ones that subsequently sold by them, I didn't include those. Uh, in as as a as a statistical point, so this number would have actually been quite a bit higher for that person. So again, remember these are all top performing agents, most of them not performing above average, and these are the numbers that you, if you're a real estate agent, this is what you should be focusing on. This is what you should be say, selling to yourself. I need to beat the average for each house. So whether it's the price or the days on market. I, I should be looking to beat the average. I need to perform better than average because most agents don't. And once you've done that for a little while, you can wave that flag and show it to people to demonstrate, this is what I do. I focus on quality service rather than quantity of service, and it shows in my numbers. Um, I'm totally cool with that becoming the mantra of the business. I would love for that to become the way that it is. I don't see it happening anytime real soon, there's so much pushback on it in the business in general. It's a little bit goofy. Are there people who I know who lean into this? Yeah. Um, but as you might guess, as someone who does a podcast and talks a lot about real estate things, I've talked to hundreds, if not thousands of agents since I've been doing this since 2007. And I have come across two agents that, uh, that indicate to me that this is the way they like to do their business. So that's my sample size, two out of hundreds, possibly thousands. All right, folks, I hope that's been useful. You know, and this, this has been more of a chatting about stuff kind of show. And I hope I hope this has been helpful information that you can kind of, if you're an agent, hopefully it can make you do your business better. The other thing I'd put out here is the, the, the top agents, what they tend to do is they have their checklist and they go with it, right? They have the same thing they do for every listing, which makes it absolutely repeatable and absolutely generic so that it's always the same thing. The problem is, and because the big word is scalability, right? Uh, all these agents want to make their business scalable. Well, here's the problem. First of all, it's a business that doesn't lend itself to being scaled and giving the level of service the client should expect and demand. But also it makes you the most automatable people on the planet. If you can do this, if you can scale it and you can create your checklists and all these wonderful things, You've created a workflow that can be automated so that you aren't involved anymore. So what will happen is at some point, the way you do business is going to get automated. Maybe not. I mean, given, given how much success there has been in sort of masking what real estate agents should really be judged by, I mean, decades and decades of it, who knows? But I'll tell you what, in my world, that's, that's something that gets automated, right? That's, that's a live in the cloud automated process that doesn't require you as an agent to be involved other than to open doors for people um, and be there for inspections. 
right? Uh, it really limits what you need to do, which obviously would sound great to you, right? Because suddenly that that 6.9 hours you were spending because you needed to do those 300 deals in a year suddenly is going to be three hours because all you're going to do is letting people get access to the property. But uh, keep that in mind. For those of you who are going, if, for those of you who are providing quality, automation doesn't work, right? Because there, there's the, the list always exists for every property, but you might do items on that list a little differently depending on the property, which automation doesn't account for because automation automates and doesn't grok perhaps an aesthetic difference between two properties. So, all right, folks, I hope that's been valuable. Uh, the goal is always to leave you with more knowledge on the table than I take up in your time. Absolutely hope we've achieved that this time. Thanks for listening. And again, join me this Saturday for coffee and real estate live chat. I'd love to see you and, and talk through some of the interesting real estate news and numbers that we're gonna see for the month of December. So looking forward to see you there. Thanks again for listening. I'll talk to y'all next time.